Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome today's session is on IgA nephropathy so we will uh, have a look into the uh, different aspects of the pathology of IgA nephropathy the clinical features the lab findings etc and before that we will uh, look at a case which has been diagnosed as IgA nephropathy so a 42 year old uh, male uh, who was uh, recently diagnosed as a uh, being hypotensive presents with reduced uh, urine output for the last two days he gives history of repeated episodes of high colored urine for the past one year and uh, has bilateral pitting pedal edema urine examination uh, detected uh, 3 plus protein numerous rvcs per hypa field pus cells of 6 to 8 per hypa field and serum urea creatinine were elevated uh, total protein was 5.1 uh, grams per deciliter, C3 was 42 milligrams per deciliter and ESR was 92 centimeters in NR. The biopsy of the same done showed diffuse proliferative glomulonephritis with 40 percent crescents and immunofluorescence depicted uh, IgA dominant deposits especially in the mesangium with focal segmental glomular capillary, capillary wall deposits. C3 was uh, 2 plus along with IgG and it was lambda dominant over kappa. IgM and C1Q as well as fibrinogen were negative. So, this was diagnosed to be a case of IgAN. So, what exactly is IgAN? So, we will study the etiology and pathogenesis of this disease. So, we will have a look at the renal morphology under the headings of light microscopy, the immunofluorescence picture as well as electron microscopy. Then we will uh, uh, see the clinical features including the laboratory diagnosis of uh, IgA nephropathy and the progression of this disease as well as the complications associated with the case of IgA nephropathy. So, what is IgA nephropathy is also known as Berger's disease. Now, this is uh, characterized by prominent IgA deposits in the mesangium on immunofluorescence and it is a frequent cause of recurrent hematuria in patients. Now, most common glomulonephritis worldwide is thought to be IgA nephropathy. It overlaps in children especially with uh, a condition known as Henoch-Shanlain purpura and secondary IgA nephropathy is also been detected in uh, patients with liver diseases as well as with intestinal disease. In uh, liver diseases, it is because of uh, catabolism of polymeric forms of IgA usually occurs in the liver and in these cases, it is reduced. In intestinal disease, there are mucosal abnormalities which may give rise to this IgA nephropathy. It is just uh, 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 theory right now and it has not been definitely proved. Etiologically, uh, MHC2 is held responsible for this condition along with uh, uh, predisposition to uh, the uh, disease developing following uh, uh, exposure to certain kinds of bacteria or particular antigens in food as well as viruses. So, the pathogenesis behind development of this disease is uh, most importantly aberrant glycosylation of IgA which is deposited in the glomerula mesangium along with its antibody and activation of the alternate complement pathway. So, it is a multi hit etiology normally IgA is in monomeric form in plasma and the polymeric forms are catabolized by the liver. Now, in IgA nephropathy, polymeric IgA is seen in the plasma, but this alone does not account for the disease. So, what exactly happens? Familial susceptibility to this disease is uh, HLA linked and uh, may be associated with certain uh, uh, loci on uh, MHC2. And uh, environmental studies as well as epidemiological studies have shown that uh, the uh, uh, susceptibility to disease may also be in some individuals linked to uh, altered response to certain viruses, bacteria or uh, certain antigens uh, uh, in food. So, 
what happens in these individuals is that there is a hereditary or acquired defect which causes abnormal binding of uh, your galactose linked sugar called as O linked glycan to a specific region in IgA specifically IgA1 and this in turn gives rise to an abnormally glycosylated IgA. The most important culprit in development of IgA nephropathy is this abnormally glycosylated IgA. Abnormally glycosylated IgA uh, goes into the glomerulus and specifically deposits in the mesangium. Meanwhile, circulating abnormally glycosylated IgA polymers uh, elicit an uh, immune response and therefore, autoantibodies will bind to it. This circulating immune complex is then deposited in the mesangium. Meanwhile, the antigen uh, which has been uh, deposited there earlier on that is this abnormally glycosylated IgA causes immune complex deposition there. So, in the mesangium an immune complex is formed or a circulating immune complex can also be deposited. Now, both of these give rise to expansion of the mesangium. So, we will see how the mesangium is expanded. This is how it is normally and this is how it is in IgA nephropathy. So, it uh, stimulates the mesangial cells to proliferate and they get activated and secrete growth factors, cytokines as well as extracellular matrix and that is why there is mesangial expansion and mesangial hypercellularity. Now, these in turn activate the alternate complement pathway that is uh, C3 levels are uh, increased here and C3 will be deposited there. The activated mesangial cells and uh, endothelial cells will uh, secrete certain cytokines and these bring the WBCs to that location. So, the activated WBCs uh, will uh, be involved in inflammation as well as repair wherein they may remove some of these immune complexes. Under the light microscopy, the glomerular lesions are found to be variable that is uh, all glomeruli are not affected similarly, different kinds of lesions can be seen in uh, the glomeruli. Now, the glomeruli can be normal or uh, they can progress to mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis which means proliferation in the mesangial region of the glomerulus. Now, if more than 50 percent of the glomeruli in a particular biopsy are involved, then we call it as diffuse as depicted in this picture. So, more than 50 percent of the glomeruli are involved, it is diffuse. Less than 50 percent of the glomeruli or up to 50 percent of the glomeruli are involved, it is focal. So, we call it as diffuse proliferative or diffuse mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis or focal proliferative or focal mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. Then, in each glomerulus, if the entire glomerulus is involved, then it is called as global, whereas if less than 50 percent of the glomerulus is involved, it is called as segmental. The cellularity in the affected glomeruli is variable and it involves the mesangial cells, the endothelial cells as well as WBCs. Rarely, you can get uh, uh, the uh, epithelial uh, cell proliferation within the Bowman's uh, space. So, whenever the uh, areas of inflammation heal within the glomerulus, it gives rise to segmental sclerosis. So, depending on these, uh, we have uh, uh, immunofluorescence pattern also. So, on immunofluorescence, the predominant pattern is deposition of IgA most important uh, in uh, the mesangial region. So, it is the dominant pattern. So, IgA dominant along with C3. So, if IgA and C3 are uh, present to the similar extent, then it is known as co-dominant. It is mostly seen in the mesangium, but rarely it can affect the capillary walls also. IgG may sometimes be seen as also IgM, but C1q that is a classical pathway is negative. Usually amongst kappa and lambda, it is lambda dominant and rarely properdin can also be seen. Electron microscopy depicts mesangial deposits predominantly and rarely a few deposits can be seen in the subendothelial space. So, this is a, a special stain that is a periodic acid shift stain, past stain depicting uh, expansion of the mesangium as well as increased number of mesangial cells. We call uh, uh, mesangial hypercellularity whenever the mesangial space is occupied by more than 3 mesangial cells. The endothelial capillaries meanwhile look uh, normal here. 
a slight endothelial proliferation in this aspect, the tubules etcetera appear normal as well as the Bowman's space here there is no epithelial proliferation. Now, this is immunofluorescence uh, depicting the same pattern that is in the mesangium you are seeing immunofluorescence deposits this is an IgA picture. Now, we use the modified Oxford classification system to uh, uh, prognosticate uh, such patients and this is the MEST C criteria is what is followed right now. Earlier different classification systems were there, uh, so which uh, gave rise to a lot of confusions on the clinical aspect of these uh, uh, patients of IgA nephropathy. So, now uh, universally MEST C has been recognized as an important uh, classification system adequate prediction of clinical outcome and risk to progression as well as prognosis is depicted with uh, this MEST C criteria especially they say uh, as of now they say the uh, T aspect is uh, uh, more indicative. Okay, from the microscopy let us uh, move on to the laboratory findings in this. Now, the laboratory findings depend on uh, the presentation of the patient whether it is just with hematuria or uh, proteinuria. Hematuria is seen in most of the patients it could be microscopic or macrohematuria. Microscopic hematuria we say whenever there are uh, at the most uh, 3 uh, your RBCs per hypa field under the microscope in at least 2 to 3 uh, your samples of uh, urine. Proteinuria could be mild, moderate or severe, but usually it is mild as a team that is elevation of blood urea nitrogen is seen in uh, patients who progress uh, faster to renal failure that is acute renal failure and uh, nephritic syndrome is another presentation. Now, besides that rarely other presentations include uh, rapidly progressive glomulonephritis, uh, then uh, nephrotic syndrome etcetera. Acute renal failure is very rare as well as chronic kidney disease. Now, chronic kidney disease is how most of these patients uh, progress, but the presentation as chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease is rare. So, in the urine what do we see? So, in urine protein is usually negative, but can be present, but blood is most often present as I said it could be microhematuria or macrohematuria. The other aspects that is urobilinogen, ketone bodies, bilirubin, nitrite etcetera are not seen. Under the microscope RBCs are normally present in these patients. Uh, the dysmorphic RBCs are more often seen and this is because it is a case of glomerulonephritis. Pus cells that is your WBCs uh, will be seen and epithelial cells may also be present. Cas are WBC cas or granular cas. Creatinine levels are usually normal or may be elevated depending on whether the patient has got uh, nephritic syndrome as well as progression to uh, rapidly progressive glomulonephritis or acute renal failure. Urea also is usually normal, but may be elevated. Lipid profile is normal unless the patient progresses to nephrotic syndrome. C3 levels are normal can sometimes be reduced. Now, when it is reduced it uh, says that the patient is progressing to uh, more severe renal disease. C4 levels are normal and elevation of C4 levels are also found to be associated with progression to severe renal disease. Proteins are usually normal, but may be uh, reduced also albumin and globulin will be reduced if proteins are reduced. Clinically it uh, usually affects older children and young adults. Then uh, presentation is as hematuria which is uh, episodic or persistent. Only hematuria is seen in 30 to 40 percent of the patients and this follows a particular infection may be respiratory tract infection or involving the gastrointestinal tract or the genitourinary tract. Then uh, this microhematuria is in episodes meaning it subsides and then recurs, subsides and then recurs. So, episodic hematuria is typical. Gross hematuria if uh, seen is usually in younger patients whereas, microhematuria is in older individuals. Sometimes it can be hematuria along with mild proteinuria and rarely as an acute nephritic syndrome or acute renal failure in 5 to 10 percent of the patients. Uh, 
very rare or occasionally it can be as nephrotic syndrome and most of these uh, patients can progress to chronic kidney disease or it could be a presentation as chronic kidney disease when the earlier symptoms have been uh, very mild. So, that can be an insidious onset of chronic kidney disease. So, how do these patients uh, progress. So, rarely they can progress to rapidly progressive glomulonephritis or uh, acute renal failure, especially in uh, children who present with gross hematuria, hypertension and azotemia. Nephrotic syndrome is seen only in 5 percent of the patient and chronic kidney disease uh, progression to that is uh, in 15 to 40 percent of individuals with IgA nephropathy. The progression when it occurs is usually very slow. So, uh, some of these patients will uh, develop chronic kidney disease and an increased risk of progression to chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease is seen in association with uh, an onset in older individuals, heavy proteinuria, hypertension at presentation and the extent of glomulosclerosis on biopsy. Now, IgA nephropathy can occur in transplanted kidneys also to an extent of 15 percent of cases. So, this uh, recurrence is uh, deleterious to the um, transplanted kidney. So, with this we come to the conclusion of this session on IgA nephropathy. So, it is one of the most common glomulonephritis presentation is as hematuria or as nephritic syndrome. It is associated with three factors that is aberrant glycosylation of IgA in the mesangium leading to mesangial deposits of IgA on immunofluorescence and activation of the alternate complement pathway. Histopathologically, we will see mesangioproliferative glomulonephritis with IgA and C3, either co-dominant or IgA dominant deposits on immunofluorescence and mesangial deposit predominance on electron microscopy. The revised Oxford Messi classification is important uh, uh, for uh, predicting the outcome as well as prognosis in these patients. That is it for the today. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you.